Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to feast upon your word as we await your return. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We're so aware of our limitations, and we are so thankful that we have you as our one teacher, our comforter, and our teacher. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last video, we had just about finished chapter 11, and we're going into chapter 12. In the previous chapter, we uh, concluded by looking at, uh, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood and the body and the blood of the Lord. And I talked a little bit about that. I, I suggested that what I believe, and you don't have to agree with me, is that to dr eat and drink unworthily is to think that we had anything to do with it. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That damnation is not condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But we can come to, to realize in our lives by not understanding the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we can miss out on experiencing all those benefits and blessings that go along with that. And, and that by not discerning the body of Christ. The eating and drinking unworthily seems to be answered, the, what, you know, the question of, of what, is, what does it mean to eat and drink unworthily seems to be answered by the question, uh, by the verse itself, uh, the text itself, that we're not discerning the Lord's body. That is, who he was, what he did, uh, and so on and so forth. So when we come together to eat, wait on one another if any man hunger let him eat at home that you come not together unto condemnation and the rest will i set in order when i come and i remind you this is god's word not paul's and you can look at that as paul's going to set things in order the rest of the things in order when he comes or you can look at that as i do which is a little off the beaten path which is that it's uh, it's a direct reference to the lord's uh, return where that he will set in order those things that remain. Now, and I know that may seem like a stretch to some of you, but that's basically how I'm looking at that. So now that takes us into chapter 12, uh, and we haven't ever left the main theme or the central thought that we are to flee from idolatry. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, dumb idols, even as you were led. So we haven't left that train of thought that deals with idolatry. These things happened, uh, happened to Israel for our learning, and we're exhorted to flee from idolatry. That's anything. I, I, I understand idolatry as being... Basically, you're placing your trust, your confidence, your hope in anything other than Jesus Christ. So we looked at the Lord's Supper, and of course, I've got I've got a uh, chalk. Many of you know Choctaw. Uh, I'm outside doing this video because I'm just kind of any chance I get to do that, I'm going to do that because I just get tired of being inside all the time. So uh, uh, I needed a good background, and, and he's probably more of a distraction. But if you, can, if you can bear with me here, I hope to shed some light on the opening verses of chapter 12. We are exhorted to flee from idolatry. We did not depart from that theme in the 11th chapter. We had the Lord's Supper, but it really wasn't a departure. The, the difference between those who worship idols and we who worship Christ is that the one that we worship is alive and he speaks. He's not a dumb idol, 
okay? He's not a dumb idol that can't speak. Now, can you imagine worshiping something, folks, that can't even speak, can't say a word? They can't, they can't do anything. And we are exhorted to flee from idolatry, and the urgency of that present imperative is that it is a threat, okay? It's easy to worship stocks and bonds. It's easy to worship a bank account. It's easy to worship another person, a spouse, a, a girlfriend, a, a job, something that we think provides security. Anything in your mind that provides you security and protection and, and peace and enjoyment is, is something easy to worship. And many times God doesn't seem to do that. He doesn't seem, uh, you know, our situation doesn't seem pleasant uh, and and so are we willing to grasp the truth that unto you it's been granted not only to believe on him but to suffer for his sake because the suffering would indicate how valuable or how important that truth is to us what we worship can speak and can move and in uh, in this open in these opening verses of this chapter we're going to see that there are diversities of gifts. The word is charis, graces, but the same Spirit. It is God who works all in all. They are of the Spirit. They are given to every believer for the health of the body. God distributes those gracious gifts to every believer individually as He wills. Okay, so you think we ought to stop trying to do all that ourselves? You know, we don't seem to have any problem seeing that we were once misled by idols, which is what the text says, but now all of a sudden we can't believe that we're being led by the Holy Spirit when we are. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, says Romans 8, 14. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost, uh, the authorized version, I prefer Holy Spirit. Uh, ghost implies a disembodied spirit. Uh, so I'm going to translate that Holy Spirit. I'm going to suggest that only the new man can hear God speak. It, it's easy to be uh, led away to dumb idols, to idols that can't speak. And if they can't speak, they can't do anything for us. I want you to understand this is God, not Paul, telling the Corinthians. God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, is telling us that He wants us to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Simple words, but, but interesting. I mean, do folks really grasp the fact that that baby born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, was God Almighty, God incarnate, in human flesh, uh, but he, he had created man in his own image, and he established the law of his righteousness, and the only result, the only possible solution for sin was the payment of an infinite life. We needed, folks, we needed a kinsman redeemer. But that kinsman redeemer, just, uh, just, just those words, kinsman, redeemer. You know, not enough that, 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 uh, that kinsman had to, first of all, be willing to redeem us. And secondly, he needed to be able to redeem us. And there wasn't any such kinsman redeemer. I mean, there might have been, I suppose there might have been any number willing but unable to pay the price. I mean, who could pay the price of eternal death? No kinsman you had could, could pay that. Wouldn't make any difference whether he was willing or not. And if the chips were really down and he understood the consequences, he probably wouldn't be willing. But God the Son was willing to leave heaven's glory and become my kinsman he was incarnate in flesh man took upon himself the form of a servant made in the likeness of man and he did that because it was the will of his father he did that because he loved us and died in our place he did that god did that i don't know who's redeemed and who isn't but i i with fear and trembling say that to suggest that jesus christ is not jehovah god is calling him accursed 
Calling God who came as our kinsman, redeemer, just a man is the same as calling Christ accursed. And we didn't ask him to die for us, folks. Not a one of you out there, okay, asked Jesus Christ to die in your place. None of us did. In fact, we were his enemy. We were not seeking him. We were not working for him. There was no fear of God in our eyes. And in that condition, he died for us. We didn't ask him to. Those are the ones who are redeemed. Could a redeemed person say that Jesus is accursed? I think the, the text says that he could. He could at least infer it, but he could not do that by or in. The word there in the Greek is epsilon nu, in the Holy Spirit. What we're being told in this verse is that we don't have a dumb idol who can't speak. We have God Almighty who can speak, and he's spoken to us in this book. The Holy Spirit is in our speaking. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that He's always speaking by the Holy Spirit. And I don't think that there are two subjects here in this passage. The expression, no man, seems to me that's the same man. The same person cannot possibly call Christ accursed unless He's not speaking in the Spirit. No man speaking by the Spirit of God can call Christ accursed. And that same no man can say that he's Lord, but in the Holy Spirit. I think it's the same guy. I don't, I don't think the no man speaking by the Spirit of God calling Christ accursed is a non-believer. I think it says the believer speaking by God's Spirit or in God's Spirit cannot possibly do that. He's not able. He doesn't have the, the ability, the power to say that Jesus Christ is accursed. That's kind of why I see the old man, new man here in these, in these verses. No man has the power to say that he's the Lord except in the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. I think it's the same man. I think it's a believer. Now, maybe that puts me at a little bit, a, a bit of odds with a bunch of you, but I don't see the change in subject. What I think the text is saying is that our spirit is not speechless. And, and is, it's the Spirit of God. We're to be filled with the Spirit. We're to walk in the Spirit. We're to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not by wine. The verse is telling me that, that under the control of the Holy Spirit, you can't say that Jesus is accursed. And under the control of the Holy Spirit, you are going to say that Jesus is Lord. The incarnate Christ. That's Jesus of Nazareth. Why did he say Jesus here? Okay. That's Jesus of Nazareth, Jehovah in the Old Testament. It can only be done in the Spirit of the Holy Spirit. And if one doesn't have that, he can't preach that. He can't preach it. Now there are diversities of gifts, and, and here the word is, is charismata. These are gifts of grace. That's what they are. That means that you don't deserve these gifts, folks. Okay? You haven't earned these gifts. They are given by no constraint. Read the Word. Slow down and look at it close. They are freely given. All of those that sinned and came short of the glory of God are justified freely by His grace. They're not justified because they deserve to be justified. They're not justified because they did anything. They're justified because they're His. These are gifts of grace. Okay? Grace. You don't deserve them. You didn't earn them, but there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. The one we're talking about in verse 3 is the same Spirit of God that gives these gifts of grace. And there are differences of ministries, but it's the same Lord. Same Lord. You know, folks, we seem to have a little problem admitting that we were once misled by idols, drug away by... That's what the text is saying, okay? But we have a huge problem we don't have any problem believing that, but we got a big problem believing that we're being led by God, it seems. I mean, look at the words that we have here. We have Jesus, we have God, Spirit of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, same Lord, same God in, in verse 6. I think I suggested before that you shouldn't build doctrine, I guess, on prepositions, but sometimes they're an interesting study as we go through the Word of God. It's from God, it's through Christ, that is, by means of Christ, and it's in the Holy Spirit, in, that is, in the sphere and in the control of the Holy Spirit, and it's the Trinity, one God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And there are differences of the ministries which He distributes, but it's the same Lord, the same God, the same Spirit, there are diversities of operations. Distributions would, would be a better word. There are uh, distributions, but it's the same God which works all in all. He works all things to the profit of all. Okay. Now, doesn't that verse say that every one of you have a gift? You know, a lot of times we talk about gifted people. You know, I'm persuaded the text says that God in His infinite wisdom has gifted every one of you for His glory. I don't know what part of the body of Christ you are, and I, I don't know what gift you might have, but I am persuaded that every one of us has at least one gift. And now we could launch into a, a I don't know, into a tremendous number of sermons that I've heard over the years. You know, since you know in verse 7 that every one of us have some kind of a gift given by the grace of God, you know, not because we deserved it, but by God's grace, now you ought to really spend a lot of time figuring out what it is and then improve it uh, upon it, develop it, you know, make it, nourish it, you know, whatever. And that may be true. I'm not being critical of that kind of sermon. I don't see that in the text. If you know what it is, by all means, exercise it. I mean, I'm pretty much persuaded that many of you have gifts and are exercising it and don't recognize it. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another uh, the word of knowledge, that's experiential knowledge, gnosko, by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another divers kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues now we know we saw in chapter one in uh, verse 30 of chapter one he's given unto us christ has given unto us his wisdom you know, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So I believe this gift of wisdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are those who are given a gift of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in the Scriptures, and that's wisdom. Christ is wisdom. And then the, the gift of knowledge, that's the comprehension of that. That's the gift given to me when I, I sit and I listen to somebody else exalt my Lord and bring Him out of the pages of Scripture. Those who have the ability to comprehend Jesus Christ as God's wisdom given unto us and make, and make it known to me. Then we have faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, and, and we have discerning of spirits, diverse kind of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. But... It is God, folks, who is doing the distributing here, not us, okay? I mean, how many times do we look at someone other, maybe even look at ourselves, or we judge ourselves, we judge another person. We look at our brother, though, and we say, well, you know, this, this guy or this gal, they, they, ought to, they ought to have this gift that I have, or, or they ought to have this particular such and such so-and-so gift, and, you know, if they only had that gift, well, you know, they'd be doing better. Or we, we would think that of ourselves, you know, well, if we only had the gift of this or that or the other thing. And we just, and just stop, folks, stop. All right, if you can't see in the text that you're not doing the distributing, that you're not doing the giving, that you're not doing the gracing, then read it again. Okay? It's interesting to me that there are many dear believers who just don't have a lot of intellectual capability for what it, various reasons. And Gnosko, in, experiential knowledge, emphasizes a knowledge that's based on experience, on relationship. The distinction that's being made here is that there are those who have an intellectual capability to delve into Scripture and understand it deeply, but there are also those who know the Lord deeply from the relationship not necessarily from an intellectual capacity, but rather from their relationship with Him. And, and these aren't exclusive to one another, but I think they, they complement one another. And so I think that's part of what's being said there in that. 
you know, there are some who are just really uh, brilliant in seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, wisdom in the scriptures. There are many that are not like that, but God has gifted them to comprehend. You know, they, they might, uh, I don't know, they might know a, they, they wouldn't know a, a Greek participle from a hole in the ground, but, but yet they have an incredible intuitive depth uh, Christ Je of seeing Christ Jesus in the scriptures. But the point that I see being driven hard here, folks, is that it is God who is now doing the leading and the distributing, not some dumb idol, and not certainly not man, not ourselves. Can we trust Him regarding that? You know, we were shown as a lesson, as an example of Israel in the wilderness, where that their provider, their protector, the, the rock that followed them was Christ, the living Christ. You know, ma many perished in the wilderness because of their unbelief, and here we're looking at those who drink, eat and drink unworthily, and they drink condemnation to themselves. I do not think that that means that this is a believer going to hell. And so, uh, so we're going to look more deeply uh, into this chapter as we go along. I, I love and appreciate all of you. I read all your comments. I ask for your prayers regarding the direction of this ministry. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching. There's a lot of talk about Feast of Trumpets this year, uh, September the 28th. Uh, it's Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Mark Blitz, a uh, number of other watchmen are, are looking at that date. Uh, a Feast of Trumpets uh, this year, fall of 2022, as being a potential rapture date. I have a little trouble with the church being so related to Israel, and so I'm going to explain why I believe September, there's good reason why to, that at least for me to believe that September 18th is an, an exciting day to look forward to this year. It's uh, let's just suppose the rapture took place on September the 18th. Ten days after that, well, is the 28th. Uh, that's the Feast of Trumpets. Now, Christ ascended. Uh, we ascend at the rapture, and ten days later is Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Christ ascended, and the Holy Spirit came ten days later, and the church begins. So we ascend. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes ten days later, and the tribulation begins. Uh, so the tribulation is, in effect, heralded in by a Feast of Trumpets. Now, I got this by constructing the timeline, uh, working the timeline backwards. Uh, I started with Trumpets of 2029, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, and I worked backwards to September 18, 2022. Uh, it's a day of zero significance on the, on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, Calendar-wise, it's just a day of non-significance. And I think that's interesting because I, I've always thought the Lord must return on a Pentecost or a Feast of Trumpets or, or something. Now I'm thinking a little more outside the box, and I'm going to suggest that maybe that might not be the case, and He may return on a day of no significance and catch us all by surprise, or at least catch the world by surprise, most Christians by surprise, and that's not doesn't say we can't know that we're in the, the season of his return, but the actual date could catch us by surprise, and that being September 18, because if we go from September 18 through the timeline, we wind up at Feast of Trumpets in 2029. If there's a rapture on the Feast of Trumpets this year, then you go the correct number of days forward, and the second coming would occur on the Day of Atonement in 2029, and Christ would miss Feast of Trumpets, and it wouldn't be fulfilled until the following year in the fall of 2030. That's how the math works out. If you want to get excited about a Feast of Trumpets rapture this year in 2022, uh, uh, more power to you, all right? Just know that there are a specific number of days in a timeline, 
And if you go along that timeline, you have Christ returning on the Day of Atonement. The Feast of Trumpets is missed. Now you could argue that the church being raptured on a Feast of Trumpets, that fulfilled Feast of Trumpets. You could make that argument. I do not believe that that's the case. What I find more interesting is backing up from the Feast of Trumpets in 2029 back to September 18th is quite intriguing. 9-18, September 18 this year. That is uh, the first day of the week. It's a Sunday. The Sabbath being Saturday. Sunday's the first day of the week. Christ rose on the first day of the week. Many would be in church. We're looking at a rap potential possible rapture date, September 18, which is a Sunday, in which many people would be in church. As I mentioned, a trumpet's rapture this year would see Christ return on the Day of Atonement in 2029. That's interesting, but I just do not see how that Christ could miss trumpets in 2029. That Feast of Trumpets lying inside the Tribulation period prior to His return, leaving it unfulfilled until the year 2030, almost a year later. But I will say that, in, at least in my opinion, the 18th of September, as well as the 28th of September, Feast of Trumpets, they uh, are both high watch dates, as far as I'm concerned. But I'm leaning toward 918, and here's why. Uh, 918 to the midpoint just happens to be April Fool's Day uh, slash Passover of 2026, Passover of 2026, April Fool's Day and Passover April 2. It's always a, a, a two-day thing, okay? Uh, we're never li really looking at a day, just like September 18. It could be 18 or 19. It's always, a, we always have a two-day window. And so, uh, if the rapture occurs this September 18, you're looking at a midpoint which would land precisely on Passover, or within a day of it, or April Fool's, April Fool's Passover 2026. And I find that interesting. That's perfect for the abomination of desolation, and as well as April Fool's Day, because the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now what really makes it interesting is that if you go on forward to the second coming date, it gives you a second coming date of Christ's birthday, Jesus' birthday on a 9-11, a September 11th, which is a Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, Trumpets in 2029 is on a September 11th, His birthday. Now I've done a number of videos on why I believe that September 11th is His birthday, uh, but this is what the math is showing uh, me here. He would return on His birthday on a Feast of Trumpets on 9-11 of 2029 if we were raptured September 18th of this year. If we were raptured on Feast of Trumpets this year, that he would not return on his birthday. His, he would miss his birthday, he would miss, miss the Feast of Trumpets in 2029, leaving it to be unfulfilled until the year 2030, the fall of 2030. If we go on forward with our calculations, the kingdom age would begin inside the eight days of Hanukkah. In fact, to be more precise, it'd be the fourth day of Hanukkah. And so the kingdom age would begin inside the eight day uh, celebration of Hanukkah. Now that's how the math works out. So I'm leaning really hard on the rapture being on September 18th. I may even take the day off. Uh, this is a personal conviction. This is, this is not, uh, I'm not by any means saying that this is what is going to take place. But as far as all of the facts I've given you, as far as the math goes, the dates are concerned, uh, this timeline, just like any other, uh, you can't dispute the math, you can't dispute the dates. Therefore, the timeline is flawless. It's just up to what God whether or not, you know, He uh, chooses to use that or not. Uh, to me, it's just another perfect timeline. It is a bulletproof timeline. I don't mind saying that. When I say that, when I say it's a bulletproof timeline, 
What I'm saying is that you can't show me where the dates that I've given are wrong or the number, the day counts that I've given are incorrect. So I'm leaning hard on September 18th being the day the Lord takes me on. Uh, if you want to join in with me and, and, and hoping for that, uh, I, that would be great. If you do not, then that's fine too. A rapture on September 18th were that His second coming would be on a feast of trumpets, not the rapture. Sometimes we need to think outside the box. It's just wonderful that we've got two dates this September to look forward to, September 18 and as well as September 28. Thank you for watching.